Chapter 1. My Mother On the day that my mother, Yvonne, was due to deliver her baby, she stopped at my father's petrol station to inform him that baby number four was on its way. Here she met an uncle of hers who was visiting from Durban at the time. He promptly went to the cafe across the road and purchased a large tin of biscuits with a picture of a little girl with long blonde hair on the lid. He proudly presented this to my mother and announced that this time she would be having a daughter. He then bid her farewell and left for Durban, which at that time was approximately a two-hour journey. On his arrival at his home, his wife gladly greeted him with joyous news. Yvonne has just had a baby daughter. He stood in utter disbelief and replied, How can that be? I just left her at the petrol pumps. How was he to know that Yvonne had speedily delivered her first three babies, all sons? At that time, Gregory, Stephen and Andrew were aged three, two and one. So the delivery of her fourth baby was even quicker. From that day, dear Uncle Ray affectionately called me Petrol Pumps. I was otherwise mostly referred to by the name my parents chose for me, Sonia. So this is the account of my arrival here on this earth a small hospital in Zululand, on the 5th of January 1962, being the only daughter of a family of boys. Believe this, for it is true. A little blonde-haired girl is what I grew up to be. Having strong Norwegian heritage, I did not let Uncle Ray down. By the time I was three years old, my parents had moved down the coast from Zululand to Westfall, inland from the city of Durban, Natal. It was in this rapidly expanding suburb that our family lived for the next 30 years. My father then started a building and real estate business, which he developed throughout our time in Westville. He is a well-admired and respected, God-fearing man of the community. My father, being of Scottish heritage and my mother of Norwegian heritage, naturally supported strong homemaking and thriftiness. My mother's occupation was home and family, and specialising in that, she naturally passed her passion and skills onto her family. One of her skills was money management. It would simply not do to buy four school jerseys if you could knit them yourself for the purchase price of one. She bought a knitting machine, and so naturally I was taught to knit on this knitting machine from a young age. At the age of seven, my mother bought me my first sewing machine, and sewing lessons began twice a week. For this, I truly was not grateful at the time of my childhood. My friends were playing while I was sewing. Oh, how I thank my mother today for not softening to the cries and complaints of my youth, but rather staying firmly on the course which she knew was going to be of great value for my life. This reminds me of the baking and cooking lessons which were built into the week's routines. At a young age, I was confidently cooking meals for my family of six. Saturday morning was baking day. By age 12, I was confident in baking biscuits, rusks, savoury and sweet pies and a large variety of cakes. All this, of course, required dedication and commitment from my mother and a firm determination to not be swayed by the grumbles she heard from her little bleating lambs along the way. Another aspect of this time and dedication was the supporting of her children in their schooling activities. I cannot recall a single school event that my parents did not attend, unlike so many parents who were not at such events as they had other commitments. When I swam in a gala, I came last in every race. My brother, on the other hand, who was, in my eyes, an absolute genius because he excelled in everything he did, he came first. My mother would say, Well done, Gregory, you swam your very best and did so well today. And Sonia, you also swam your very best and did very well. Well done, my girl. Because she was there to support and encourage her children, she observed opportunities to later address matters that she could help her children with. For example, if Gregory displayed a slight attitude of pride in receiving his first prize medal, she would find the right moment to use this observation to teach him the importance of humility. If she observed that I was downhearted after coming last, she would address this and teach me the value of not comparing my best with another's best. If I knew I had not given my absolute best, I had better be sure that the very next opportunity I had before me, I better do all to give my utmost. 
How is it possible for a mother to teach her children lessons far deeper than the experience of swimming in a school gala? Had she not been there to give her love, time and commitment to witness these fleeting expressions of pride or sorrow on the faces of her children? It is the love of God given to the parents which makes it possible for a mother to be so closely attentive to the hearts of her children. I recall this now and I remember how sometimes I disliked the fact that my mother was always encouraging us to give our utmost. Once we had given our utmost, she would show us that we could improve on that by aiming to raise our own standard and in so doing we would constantly be improving our level of utmost. I remember being really angry with her for this and even believing that she was being unfair, harsh and uncaring, especially when I believed that I had just given my absolute best. This, of course, was my immaturity at the time, for now I am so very grateful for the unrelenting support I received to raise the standard. This reflection of discouragement would not cause either of my parents to lower their level of utmost so as to cause me to feel complacent. They simply reminded me as to how I could improve and waited to see me working towards that improvement. Only in later years did I have a full appreciation of this. An attribute which I highly admired in my parents was that although their four children were of such diverse nature and character, at no time were any of us ever allowed to compare ourselves with each other. My parents never measured us against each other. Gregory excelled in his sport and was a top student and sportsman. My second brother, Stephen, was a real middle-of-the-road man. I have come to realise how Stephen brought the even balance into the family. We could call him the family jester, always full of fun, simple and straightforward. And then there was Andrew, my third brother. He had complex learning difficulties and was mischievous and highly active in nature. From a learning perspective, I could relate to Andrew, as I too had many learning struggles, but my nature was entirely different from him and that I had a quiet and gentle spirit. Although my parents never expected one child to meet the standards of the other, we were all expected to obey and uphold the firm principles laid down by them. In addition, we were never allowed to consider that the standard set could be compromised in any way. This matter was not up for debate or discussion. The statement was clear. This is the family you are being raised in, and these are the principles we live by. We do not change or adapt them according to the year, fashion, style, neighbour, friends, or other extended family members. This gave us all a firm foundation of security, which in another word could be called love. Love was not taught to us as something that was shown by giving each other gifts or using terms of endearment or in demonstrations of lavish affections. I know that, without question, I would choose to know love in the way in which it was given to me, through commitment, self-sacrifice and unselfish, dedicated time which my parents gave us. This is not to say that we never knew demonstrations of love through affection, gifts and kind words, but these expressions of love were rather the cherries on top of the beautiful cake. The cake itself was made by using all the correct ingredients and carefully blended to cause it to rise and be good and wholesome. The ingredients my parents used were principles, standards, character and non-compromise, carefully blended together with love, tenderness and wisdom. Added to that there were care, respect and appreciation. Appreciation for knowing that God is the creator and that each one of these ingredients is made and given by him to be carefully handled and wisely put together as he instructs it to be. The final test is when the cake must be put into the oven, the fire, and then wait to see the outcome. Has the cake risen to its fullest capacity? Is it ready, wholesome, sweet and lovely, good and healthy, pleasant to look at and even more wonderful to enjoy? If this is so, then God would surely be well pleased with the parents to whom he had given these precious children to raise and train and to put them through the test of fire, life. Parenting is a great responsibility, honour, privilege and gift, and God's love is the key for raising his little people up to serve and delight them in all of their ways. If we were to do a deep study on God's love, we would very soon find that the love which the world teaches is very different from heavenly love which is God. 
The love that I grew to understand was given in the absolute acceptance of who I was and a constant encouraging to develop in the purpose for which I was created. When my school teachers considered me to be a failure, my parents stood by me pointing out the things in which I excelled. The emphasis was not in the knowledge I had either understood or misunderstood, but it was rather than how I was growing in character and purpose. My brother Gregory was a top A student, yet that did not cause my parents to consider that he excelled and achieved in any greater way than Andrew or I with our difficulties in learning. With their emphasis being character, they had to train Gregory's character just as they did their other children. Now that I'm an adult, I often express my astonishment to my mother at the way she maintained this focus throughout our growing years. Andrew learned with his hands, as I did. Our parents acknowledged this and so directed us strongly and positively in this way. When Andrew's teachers called my mother into the school to inform her that he could not learn and that he was too mischievous and disruptive in class, her response was, Well, that is because a closed classroom does not enhance learning for him because he learns best by doing things with his hands, so naturally he would be fidgety. The teachers were only interested in the fact that his report card showed very low levels of achievement. Eventually it was suggested that Andrew be removed from the school. This delighted my parents as they felt that Andrew could now finally be set free and allowed to develop to his full potential. He was an excellent craftsman. From a young age he created wonderful pieces of woodwork, and once he left school and went into an apprenticeship, he excelled to the point that he was top student in his field. With my mother's objective being to build our characters for life, she never hesitated to use every opportunity for this. It was not uncommon for her to decide to keep me home from school for a few days while she was busy with the project which she felt I could benefit from. I have a wonderful memory of helping my mother to cover our family lounge suite, and in so doing, I learnt many skills in the art of upholstery. I have since covered the lounge suites in my own home, saving on unnecessary expense and giving my own children the opportunity to learn skills in upholstery and thriftiness. While not wishing to be negative regarding my school life, I recognise that my learning happened at home. The learning which I carried through to my own family as an adult and which supported me for life was that which I gained at home. Because my parents understood me, They encouraged the areas where they saw natural ability and supported me in those areas where I had struggles. My school days had, however, left their mark on me in that I was called the class dummy and I was not included on school outings or field trips because taking the special class children would not be a good reflection on the school. I was put in class with the school rebels as well as those who had difficulties in learning, so we were all labelled dummies, rebels or freaks. I recall a most painful experience. The school was having a handiwork competition, so I worked on a wall hanging which I entered into the competition. My tapestry received first prize, but when it was discovered that it had been submitted by a student in the special class, it was dropped from the competition. Experiences such as these were more numerous than are worth mentioning. What would be of greater value to recall and share is that it took tremendous encouragement and support from my parents to ensure that I did not grow up with a very poor sense of worth. Fortunately, they directed me in ways which were good and wholesome. I did not finish my schooling and I left at an early age. I went on to cooking school and did courses in floristry, catering and horticulture before running my own fabric, haberdashery and dressmaking shop. My mother involved me in all her home ventures as I was growing up, from making and selling candles to catering for luncheons wedding parties and dinners. She ran a hiring and catering equipment business from our home, in which I was her partner. When she had a sewing contract, I was her apprentice. She ran craft classes from which I benefited, and all this she would have done and expected me to be part of, whether I was a top student or not, for she believed that she needed to prepare me for being a wife and mother of worth and value. I must mention here that my mother herself was an excellent scholar, She was captain of sports teams and head of her school, yet never did she give me the slightest sense of her being disappointed that I was not following in her academic footsteps. Although my report cards showed failed, 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 it was again the character report which was the focus. 
My parents' comments to the failure would be, just try a little hard and keep doing the best you can. But if there was a teacher's comment stating, Sonia's work could be neater, that would cause my parents to become firm and dissatisfied. I had to work extra hard to see that my next report card would reflect that my work was neater. To this day, I'm amazed at report cards. A little card sent home to parents telling them how their children are doing. I feel so privileged that I educated my children at home and so do not have to read the remarks on report cards from those who do not know my children and love them as I, their mother does. When I consider the suffering inflicted by some teachers who were harsh and uncaring of my difficulties and also the children who had much fun at the expense of my learning difficulties, I again give deep thanks to God that I am able to train my own children in the environment of home and to be there to direct and support them when they are in a social environment. My children do not have to be exposed to the immature wickedness of others in order to learn to cope. Some say that this kind of exposure to the hard outside world is part of growing up. Well, I wholly disagree. If I had not had stable, loving parents, I have no doubt that such cruel treatment would have taken much effort, energy, emotion and therapy to bring healing. The world's way is to harden yourself and get tough. At no point in God's word do I read, harden your hearts and fight back. Rather I read from Hebrews 3 verse 8, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Older children at school would grab my long hair and tie it to the door handle and then close the door. I would have my lunch stolen and thrown around the classroom so that I had nothing to eat until home time. Once when I was struggling to understand a geography mapping lesson, the teacher became angry at me for my lack of understanding and yelled at me. When I cried in utter despair, I was then punished and had to stay in detention for the rest of the day. How can it possibly be that any of these experiences offer the good in developing stable, strong citizens for society, let alone citizens for heaven? God's word tells us that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 18 verse 2 Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I simply cannot see that any of these examples are examples of heaven. It also tells us that if we truly want to live to please God, then we ought to consider how delighted he would be if we were to live here on earth according to his will as it is in heaven. I do, however, believe that in the end all things work for the good of those who love him. So no matter how bad these experiences may be, whether from the cruelty of the world or in a suffering Job situation, in the end he will turn it all to the good for his name's sake. This I consider to be true in my life to this point. My experience of cruelty towards me have caused my heart to ache for others. They developed in me a deep compassion and need to care for those suffering, especially those who were experiencing cruelty simply because of who they were and not because of any wrong they had done. This grieved my heart as a child, as I found it difficult to accept that others receive punishment and suffering simply because of what or who they are. I could understand that if one did wrong, the consequence was punishment, which could cause suffering, but otherwise my heart simply broke for the innocent suffering of others. To this day, I feel a heart cry for people suffering unnecessarily in this way. I understand from this that my own pain has been turned to the good and now can be used constructively. Although I've had many opportunities in my life to offer positive input, it has not always been welcomed. This is because I was labelled as the person who had learning struggles and had not completed her education at school, yet my education for life has never ceased happening. It was labels such as unqualified and unable which seemed to inhibit me in being able to meet the cry of my heart, and that was to help the suffering. My parents had allowed my nature and spirit to grow in my heart's desire and so encouraged me in ways as to equip and prepare me for such opportunities. An opening would present itself, but I would be turned away because I did not have what the systems of the world required me to have. However, There were those that understood my heart's cry and allowed opportunities to be open to me. An example was when I worked for a season in our local library and volunteered to care for the little children that had been left there by their parents while they went shopping. 
One particular little boy, named David, was left at the library every Wednesday. David was called a Down Syndrome child. I prefer to call him my special Wednesday friend. I loved David. His expression of love was so uninhibited and unlimited. He would arrive on a Wednesday coming boldly, joyously and noisily into the library and call out, Where my friend? He was eight years old. One thing I shall never forget is the day when he wrote his own name. He bought that same piece of paper every week to show me what he had done. I had never received any expert training to suggest that teaching him to write his name would be such a very good thing. It seemed to just be the most natural thing to do, and the results of following this natural direction were far beyond what I had even considered. What a delightful, warm, loving little boy David was. I shall always remember how the magnitude of this achievement to him, even though it was so insignificant by the world standard, could not be measured. How grateful I am for each moment God has given for his love to touch and heal lives over the years. Many of these opportunities have arisen, all of which have been blessed moments to serve the Lord in his purpose. Each opportunity is a time of learning and growing to serve him more along the way and brings me to a deep awareness of God's love and how it heals. And that is not by my might, ability, success, qualifications, certificates or degrees, but by his might and by his love, which is ultimately the only answer.